Well, I think when you're evaluating an applicant, you're always trying to get a sense of the whole person. And, and, you, and you really are starting with the big picture, starting with the macro, and you are going from the big picture down to the little bits which make up that big picture. And, and so I always tend to think about it as I'm looking into an applicant's file. How do I get the best idea of who this person is in the various ways in which they live their life? So who is this person as an academic? Who is this person as a social creature? Uh, who is this person as that transitionary person from the academics to the social? Where are they going to be able to contribute on my campus? And in what ways are they going to give? And in what ways are they going to take? So the first way you do that, obviously, is the transcript. And, and that's the best way to get the broadest sense of who a student is, because we are, at the end of the day, academic institutions, and our students have to be able to graduate. And ideally, when I'm looking at academics, I'm looking more at the choices you've made over the course of your four years than I am at any particular one choice. And so I'm trying to combine all of those choices you've made and look at them in terms of scale and in terms of scope rather than focus in on one particular class or one particular grade or one particular moment in time. So I'm looking 9 through 12 and I'm looking for what I call an upward trend, meaning that as you go through high school, I want your grades to get better and I want your classes to get harder. I'm not so concerned with specifics in terms of what are you taking. I think you should take four years of English, I think you should take three years of foreign language, I think you should take math up to pre-calculus or calculus, I think you should take science, two or three years of science, but I'm not going to tell you you must take French over Spanish or you must have physics because it's more important than biology or chemistry. Those individual choices are really between you and your counselor or you and your teachers, conversations you have with parents, and also conversations you have with yourself. I mean, your own interests obviously play a role in this. And by the time you're a senior, you've earned the right to make some individual choices about how you use your electives. And I have no right to judge that, and so I don't. Uh, I'm looking at the rigor of the courses, and I think I have a right to judge the rigor of the courses. But I don't think on an individual level I can really penalize you for taking AP Psychology over AP Art History. It's neither here nor there. It's what your interest is, and it's about doing well, and it's about taking a rigorous course. And those courses are equal as far as I'm concerned, so the question then becomes which one are you more interested in? Which one are you going to be more stimulated by? Which one will you get the most out of? Number two would just be extracurricular activities. I define extracurricular activities very specifically, probably more narrowly than uh, folks at, a, at another liberal arts college. And that's because I see them as contribution and leadership and impact based. I really feel pretty strongly that if you're in a club or an organization, that club or organization has to be better because you're in it. And so if you're looking out at the sea of extracurricular activities and you're trying to figure out which ones colleges want, which ones you think are better than other ones, and you're trying to justify that, I say stop doing that, take a step back, and ask yourself which ones do I actually want to participate in and which ones do I actually want to lead. And I would rather see a student in four clubs rather than 14 if it means that that student is going to take the time to contribute to those four clubs and those four clubs will be better as a result of their membership. Because at the end of the day, that's far more important. You've made more of an impact in those four things than you ever could have in those 14 things. At CMC number three would be SATs or ACTs. And that's certainly something we can talk about in terms of the standardized testing. But the reality is your score is your score. Don't sweat about it too much. You are more than a number that you got after you took a test on a Saturday morning in October. It's third, we wait at third, we look at it third, it's third in the process. A lot of schools are, uh, you know, they use the SAT or ACT very narrowly and, and I think that that's the right move. And so that's the one thing I wouldn't freak out about because in the grand scheme of things it's probably not something you can really do much about. It's a number, you can't change the number, you just got to live with it and move on. Number four would be, extra, would be uh, uh, essays and teacher recommendations. And this is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There's going to be a couple of essays every college is going to require. And generally speaking, for schools that use the common application, there's going to be the personal statement as well as some kind of supplemental essay or short answer 
we're no exception. We have a supplemental essay. Most of the schools out there that have a supplement, that have taken the time to develop a supplement, are going to require some form of extra writing that is sort of institution specific, and, and that's just very common. So expect that. And then your recommendations. Uh, you know, choose those teachers uh, in academic subject areas. You know, for the most part, we want academic courses. So math, science, foreign language, so social studies, and English. Those are kind of the main five academic areas, and so you need to be drawing the majority of your recommendations from people who know you or teach you in those particular areas. And, and those are really the sort of most important components of the application process.